Eddie called me that in Greek, nostalgia literally means the pain from an old wound. It's a glint in your heart, far more powerful than memory alone. This device isn't a spaceship. It's a time machine. It goes backwards. Forwards. It takes us to a place where we ate to go again. It's not called a wheel. It's called a carousel. Hello everyone and welcome to another video on our own devices. I'm Jean Messi and today we are having a look at a fantastically cool piece of mid-century consumer electronics. This is a Kodak carousel slide projector programmer. And this is exactly the type of vintage gadget that I love looking at on this channel. That is devices which, in an ingenious, if sometimes roundabout way, perform a task that today would be very easily performed using modern digital computer technology. In this particular case, let's say you wanted to set up a slideshow presentation with synchronized narration and background music. Well, today you would use programs like PowerPoint or Keynote or various video editors and accomplish this task quite quickly and easily. But in the past, this was a far more involved task. So this particular device was introduced by Kodak in early 1960. Versions of this were produced for both the carousel and the cavalcade slide projectors. And this originally retailed for $95, around $1,000 today. And so what this allows you to do is connect a projector with your slideshow to a tape recorder with your narration, background music, sound effects, and other audio, such that the audio will automatically trigger the projector to change the slide at the appropriate moments. And there are a number of different applications envisioned for this. For example, if you are a teacher, a professor, or a student who for some reason can't present your slideshow in person, you can pre-record your narration, set this whole thing up, and all somebody has to do is start the tape recorder and the slides will sequence automatically. Another more interesting application that was mentioned in the advertising literature at the time was store displays where you would have a slideshow with accompanying narration running on continuous loop, showing, for example, product, sales. If you're a travel agency, you would show exotic destinations served by your agency, things like that. And since this was designed to run on reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder technology, special magazines or cartridges with a continuous tape loop were developed and manufactured specifically for this purpose. Now, synchronization between the tape recorder and the projector was accomplished by programming trigger beeps or tones into the tape, which when picked up by the programmer would automatically trigger the projector to change the slide. And a lot of you are probably having massive flashbacks right now to your school days because of course there was a manual version of this where a teacher could prepare or buy a pre-recorded lecture with accompanying slideshow where the tape had those beeps programmed into it to cue a human operator to change the slides. This is the same system, only automatic. So let's actually have a closer look at this and see how it works. Right, so this comes in a nice, robust, leatherette-covered case. Just to remove that latch, the lid hinges up, and you can actually slide it off of its hinge pins and set it aside so it doesn't get in the way. And as you can see, we have a fairly simple control panel with three dials, trigger volume, background volume, and sensitivity, three switches, on, off, play, record, and push to trigger slide, and a whole bunch of cables. Thankfully, we also have a very clear set of wiring diagrams and instructions on the inside of the lid to show us how to set this all up. So there are two basic configurations that this can be set up in, record and playback. In record mode, this acts as a hub or mixer, allowing you to record narration, background music, other sound effects onto your master tape. It also allows you to program in those trigger tones that will automatically trigger the slide projector to change the slide, at the appropriate time. So how you set this up is first, you plug this power cable into the mains. Next, you connect up your tape recorder. Now, if the tape recorder has an AC power source, you can plug that into the socket on the inside of the programmer. So they both draw from the same outlet. Now you plug the cable marked microphone into the microphone jack on the tape recorder and the one labeled speaker into the earphone or audio output jack. And in this particular case, the programmer uses quarter inch audio jacks, whereas the tape recorder uses 3.5 millimeters. So I'm going to fit these cables with these little adapters as so. Next, you connect this black power cable to the projector, as well as this trigger cable to the socket for the remote control. 
Now this has an auxiliary socket on it, so you can actually connect it up to the original remote control for the projector, allowing you to change the slides manually as well as automatically. You would then connect a microphone to the Jack Mark microphone and an external source of audio like a turntable, a television, another tape recorder, a radio to the Jack Mark background. And finally turn on the unit and switch it to record mode. So to record your master tape, you would turn on your tape recorder and your external audio source, and you would speak your narration into the microphone, and everything would get mixed in to the master tape. Now, every time you want the slide to change, you push on the push to trigger slide button, and this simultaneously changes the slide, as well as generates and records a trigger beep onto the tape. And once your master tape is recorded and programmed the way you want it, you can then reconfigure the programmer to playback mode, which is a simple process of simply disconnecting the microphone jack and switching the programmer to play mode. Everything else remains connected just as before. So now when you play your tape, every time there is a trigger beat, it is going to automatically sequence the slides. Now, unfortunately, I wasn't able to get this system to work with this particular tape recorder, and I wasn't able to find another reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder for a decent price. However, I do have the next best thing. This is a set of slides with an accompanying cassette tape that was prepared for the Royal Canadian Air Force in the 1970s, the subject in this particular case being wake turbulence. Now, as luck would have it, this tape actually has trigger beeps programmed into it, which, while ostensibly to cue a human operator to change the slide, have the exact right frequency to set off this programmer and trigger the slide projector automatically. So I'm going to load this into this rather more modern tape deck here, which I've connected up to the programmer, and we'll actually be able to see this in action. So two things to note here before we get started. Number one, I wasn't able to find a speaker output that would work with this system. And so the audio that you're going to hear was recorded separately and overlaid over this footage. Uh, in this configuration, there's nowhere for the sound to go except into the trigger mechanism, and so you really can't hear anything. And number two, the beeps on this are incredibly quiet, so once in a while, some other sound on the tape is going to make it through the filter and trigger the slide projector randomly. So this won't be a perfect demonstration of how this works, but it'll be close enough and really cool. So let's try this out. Recovery from this was impossible, and the aircraft crashed, killing the IP and student pilot. With this in mind, let's discuss wake turbulence. Our responsibility you accept by becoming a pilot is that of avoiding hazardous in-flight situations. These hazards run the gamut from near misses with other aircraft to thunderstorms. One of the most serious and insidious hazards to flight that has grown equally with aircraft technology is wake turbulence. This right, so a little janky there. It was switching at rather random intervals, but still, it's really cool to see this vintage mid-century piece of automation actually still working. And what's even cooler is how this works electronically, because this is a very elegant circuit that makes very efficient use of all of its components. So let's actually open this up and have a look inside. So to remove the control panel and access the electronics, we have to undo three screws, this one in the middle, and the ones holding on these two rubber foot pads. And the whole unit just slides right out. So here we can see some of the major components. So the entire circuit runs off a single 6AN8 triode pentode in this Moo Metal housing here, which performs several functions simultaneously. We also have an inductor here, L1, which again performs two different functions. We have a transformer, T1, to convert the 120 volt AC input into various AC and DC voltages to run the rest of the circuit. A bunch of capacitors and resistors. This big one right here happens to be C1. And then finally, a relay, K1. So to see how this all works together, let's have a look at the circuit schematic. So the lower secondary winding on transformer T1 supplies 6.3 volts AC to the filament or heater on the tube. 
Meanwhile, the upper secondary winding feeds into a half-wave rectifier comprising resistors R1 and R2, diode CR1, and capacitors C1 and C2, which supplies 200 volt smooth DC to the plates of the tube, at least as far as I can tell from the tube specifications. Now, much of the circuit simply serves to route power, audio, and control signals from the various peripherals through the programmer, but some features worth pointing out here are switch S1, which is the main power switch, S2, which toggles between record and play modes, and S3, which is the push to trigger slide button. K1 is a relay whose normally open contacts are connected to the projector remote control, allowing a slide change to be triggered either by the programmer or the remote control. Very handy if the programmer fails to recognize a trigger beep and advance the slide as intended. Now, the trigger beeps themselves are generated by the triode section of the vacuum tube, which is connected to inductor L1, capacitor C4 and C3 and resistors R7 and R9 to form a coal pits oscillator with, as far as I can determine, a frequency of 800 Hz. R7 is the grid leak resistor which gives the triode grid the correct voltage bias, while R9 is the plate load resistor. However, switch S3 is normally open and prevents voltage from being applied to the vacuum tube plate and thus the circuit from oscillating. But when S3 is pushed, it sets the vacuum tube oscillating recording a trigger beep onto the tape. At the same time, the signal received by the plate on the triode section is coupled to the control grid of the pentode section via capacitor C6 and variable resistor R14, the sensitivity control knob. Resistors R16 and R12 form a potential divider that holds the cathode on the pentode at a positive charge, preventing current from flowing through the pentode if no signal is being received by the control grid. If the signal from the Culpitz oscillator is strong enough to overcome this positive bias, then current will flow through the pentode and energize relay K1, closing the contacts and triggering the projector to advance the slide. Now when switch S2 is moved to its secondary position, switching the programmer from record to play mode, it disconnects the triode from inductor L1, converting the former into a simple audio amplifier and the latter into an audio filter tuned to the same acceptance frequency as the trigger beep it originally generated when it was part of the Culpitz oscillator. So when the trigger beep appears on the tape, all other frequencies are filtered out by L1 and the pure signal is fed into the triode for amplification. The amplified signal is then fed into the pentode, overcoming the cathode bias, allowing current to flow through the tube, and energizing relay K1, triggering the projector to change the slide. Like I said, an ingeniously elegant circuit design, and a huge shout out to my assistant Julian Horn for helping me figure out how it works. Anyway, that's all I have for you today. This one was really fun to do. It was really neat to see this device in action, and this was something that I didn't even know existed until I stumbled upon it at a flea market. And I hope you enjoyed it as well. Anyway, I'll see you next time. Another video where we'll look at yet more mid-century consumer electronics just like this, as well as other devices. Until then, I'm Jean Messier from Our Own Devices. Have a great day.